Great. What, who do we have coming up next? You tell me. <laughs> well, let's see. I, I see. I see Peter Reinhardt is still with us. Hi, Peter. Thank and you, It looks Peter. like Scott Weiner is reading a book in his, in, his, in his office. Are you in Brooklyn, Scott? I'm in Brooklyn. Nice. But we um, love to read. Do you love to read in Brooklyn? We love it. You and Peter, uh, I'm gonna I'll, here. I'll, I'll get my virtual background off. I don't have I don't have as many books in the background as you guys, but you guys oh, win for most books in your background. What's up with that? Got Peter's a couple got, of readers coming up. Peter's got a book in front of him. You know, Peter, it's funny you hold up that book. I'm not really reading American Pie. I'm reading Perfect Pan Pizza. Oh God. <laughs> you too. You too. You got you got me on the book game. Oh, I'll give up. So guys. Everybody up the closest you're, book. If you're near a book, hold it up. <laughs> hold it up. But Noel's got it. Yeah, there you go. You got it. Show that me that my book. book. I'm not faking it either. You see all those little, those little tags right there. This is. I'm reading up. both. I didn't just read it. I. This was my Bible when I was coming up. This is it. That I didn't is, know about John Che or any of those guys out there. I had to read a book, and then I had to go out to Queens and Long Island and Brooklyn and am I forgetting Long Island? I used to that twice. Staten Island. I don't even know all the boroughs. <laughs> Governor's Island. Governor's <laughs> Island. <laughs> Roosevelt you. Island. I had to read about you in this book to find you. We didn't have a neighborhood pizzeria. We had frozen pizza and microwave ovens. That's California in the 70s. You know what I'm saying? That's right. Terrible. Terrible. You go a long way, baby. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm going to turn my mic off. I'm going to turn everything over to Scott and Peter. Take it away, boys. All right. Well, Scott, it's good to see you again. Amazing to see you. Yeah, and uh, well, I love that you're, you're reading the new book. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've been hearing a lot the last two days about pan pizzas from all the, the various presenters. And uh, who would have thought two, three years ago, these uh, Detroit style of pan pizzas. And, and now uh, the, the uh, Giovanni was talking about King Umberto's and their grandma pizzas are, are front and center. Pan pizzas are in. So I feel like. Uh, like we're on the cutting edge of the latest trend. Scott, can you put your video back on? Sorry, I got disabled temporarily. There you go. Perfect. Oh, go. good, man. You're trying to censor me. I know what this is. I've been through it before. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so what are you seeing out there? You're, you, are, you are not only out way more than I am in the, in the current pizza world, but even out now uh, in getting pizzas to frontline medical workers, right? And yeah. uh, tell me about that, because I think that's extraordinary. Well, I know everyone's, Nola and everyone's been talking about it on here a bit, because this is uh, part of this effort right now with Pizza Zoom is to push some energy toward this uh, uh, campaign that we've got going called Pizza versus Pandemic. So it's a campaign from Slice Out Hunger, which is the nonprofit that I run. And uh, the idea is that we are buying pizza for frontline healthcare workers and first responders. We're buying pizza for them in hospitals, clinics, all that stuff. And we're purchasing it from small businesses, from the independent pizzerias of the United States, coast to coast, sea to shining sea, all over the place, even in Alaska, even in Hawaii, all over the dang place. So we're taking donations on our website, which is pandemic.pizza. And then we are buying pizza. I just, right before I jump down here and right after I jump off of here, I'm going to be sitting here ordering pizza for people. Well, I love that you're not just, you know, uh, having pizzerias donate the pizzas, which many are doing also, but that you're actually buying them. So you're helping the, the pizzerias also do some business. Yeah, that's, that's the idea is you've got to support everybody. Uh, pizzerias donate stuff all the time, and we love that. And a lot of them are donating food now. But I'm saying, let's buy your pizza. People want to support businesses. And because of the fact that this supports healthcare workers and small businesses, we're getting a lot of good attention from big companies who want to come in and donate a bunch of money, uh, which is great because that just means we can do this for longer. Last yeah. night we hit, we hit $200,000 last night. So uh, how many pizzas have you actually uh, purchased and delivered? 3,850 something. Uh, and I'm sure it's a number that will keep climbing. Yeah, I mean, fortunately or unfortunately, we're probably gonna we're gonna double that in the next few days for sure. Wow, 
So uh, it's a lot well, of pizza and we're buying it from, and I, I do want to mention something, Peter, uh, if anybody here is watching from their pizzeria, if you want to be involved, you don't have to do anything. If there's a, a hospital or a clinic or somewhere that needs help near you, they can ask us or you can submit them through our website to get some help. And then we comb through that list and we will be sending out food. So you don't have to, you don't have to email or call anybody to be a part of it. Uh, kind of, we'll call you. It's uh, as soon as there's a need in your area. Wow. Well, that's, that's great. So now um, I think that is one of the big questions people have is how do I've got a pizzeria. How do I get pizzas to, to hospitals? And, and you're saying have the hospital contact you or go on the website and put you in touch with the hospitals or there's, the medical groups. Yeah, there's two different ways to do it, maybe more. But one of the one of the good ways to, if you want to help and you don't want to wait for me to place an order, uh, um, Adam um, Adam Melzer from Sauce Pizzeria in in New York, he started doing this thing last week or two weeks ago, where he's, there's an option on his menu that anybody can buy a pizza for a local hospital, and he's got a bunch of hospitals that he's personally deliver donating 20 pies a day to several hospitals. If you buy a pizza for a hospital, first of all, he's going to deliver that with his 20. He's also going to double it. So he's going to match every pizza that's purchased. You can do that. You can set that up yourself. You don't have to wait for us. But with our system, if you go on, if you have a pizza, pizzeria and you're down the street from somebody who needs help, go on our website and enter them in. You can just, anybody can do it. We call them and make sure that they have a need for it. And they'll tell us, oh, you know what? Bring it next Wednesday at three o'clock. And that's what we do. So we're, we're in communication with all the hospitals and all the pizzerias. And people who want to just donate money who are not in the pizza business, but want to help you be able to get the pizza. Uh, where, what's, what's the website? Is it up? Oh, there it is. I think we've got it up there now on our. Uh, yes. On our there are like so many URLs. If you yeah. go to sliceouthunger.org slash pandemic pizza or pandemic.pizza, or pizza versus pandemic.com, org, net, whatever. Or get there. ask Jeeves, he'll tell you. <laughs> Beautiful. Wow. Well, I'm really impressed that you're able at, to place. Wait, speaking of impressed, what is this graph behind you? Oh, you missed the earlier session we had. Yeah, yeah. this is my whiteboard. I've got a lot. I don't know if anybody's at the helm right now. I see that uh, uh, Neil, uh, Noel, and Justin are both, are both probably uh, on a bathroom break. But when one of oh, them comes back, maybe Justin's here. Okay. Oh, Justin. Okay. Yeah, there's Justin. Yeah. Yeah. So Scott was just asking me about my whiteboard behind me. Can you uh, can you bring up my 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 uh, image here? Uh, yeah. Let's uh, let's let me ask Vicky. Can we make Peter big, please, so we can do another whiteboard presentation? Because as far as I can tell, Scott, this is uh, what do you call it, Pete? This the uh, I well this board is basically sort of the uh, baking 101 yeah, fundamentals uh, and the thing at the very top is what I call the baking triangle I or call what it the, called the triangle of death <laughs> and I call it the slice of life so. uh, I love it yeah that is like a slice yeah and so also basically earlier today Scott uh, we we did a very quick run through on sort of foundational pieces of information from which all other good things emerge and one is number one what is baking what is happening during baking and what are the transformations that take place in a dough product that turn it from flour to dough and from dough to, to bread or to crust? And, um, and so uh, in a sense, it's kind of like the magic journey of bread and why pizza is so beloved because it's a transformational food. I, wait, Peter, I got a question. Did, did you guys already mention your incredible TED talk? Did not, did not. Okay, did I'm that. mentioning it right now. Well, thanks. Peter thanks. Reinhardt did the most incredible TED Talk, the only one that matters. It's thanks. incredible, about the life cycle of bread, bread as birth and life. Yeah, and a lot of what's on here, other than the triangle is kind of a new, new thing for, for everybody, but the uh, transformational aspect, which I think is really my real mission and message in, as a beyond the bread, it's really what bread is signifies for me is this journey of transformation. Uh, but on the TED Talk, we, we cover that in depth. It's about a 15 minute talk. You just go to uh, Peter Reinhardt at TED uh, on you know Google it or something, and it'll lead you to that talk if you haven't already seen it. We've had about a million awesome. hits on it, which is really nice. Um, I was 900,000 of them. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, so that's what this was about. We don't have to go over it all over again, but uh, essentially, and if anyone can, see, it's blown up pretty large. If you can see it, at least you can see that uh, the idea of the triangle is that it's um, the three points are uh, temp uh, time, temperature, and ingredients, and everything happens in baking between those three cardinal points. And if you affect one of those points, then it affects the other points. Everything changes. And um, and what is baking but the application of heat to a product in an enclosed environment for the purpose of driving off moisture. And that's real textbook fundamental baking. Actually, it's all about driving off moisture, but then in the process, and this is the part they don't tell you in the books, is that in the process of driving off moisture through heat, you are affecting three oven transformations. You're caramelizing the sugars, you're gelatinizing the starches, and you're coagulating the proteins. And all that has to happen in order for a dough to be transformed into bread. And of course, within all of that, there's other drama going on. There's uh, fermentation, there's lactic and acetic uh, bacterial fermentation, there's yeast fermentation, there's uh, carbon dioxide and alcohol being created. It's a whole drama show going on in a, in a loaf of bread. So um, uh, I would love a soap opera version of that. <sighs> yeah, that's all you really need to know is those that little that little graph there in that chart uh, gives you the, the jumping off point to be able to understand that drop. Hey, Alec, how's it going, huh? Hey, <laughs> I just saw Alec, and I don't think he was wearing pants. <laughs> <laughs> I grow. I grew up today. I grew up a lot today. <laughs> right, your age of innocence is over. <laughs> yeah, it's all done now. Well, Scott, one of the things that you and I were going to talk about today, uh, I'm, and I'm glad we got to, to to bring everybody up to date on the Slice Out Hunger project that you're doing, but um, you and I both share kind of this this common journey, which is this never-ending quest for the perfect pizza. And you've chronicled it on your on your series, on your TV series, Really Dough, which is phenomenal. I mean, I think. How many, how many episodes did you crank out? About 30 or so? Yeah, yeah, right around there. Yeah, you and Mark. Uh, and I don't know if anyone uh, who's watching has not seen it, but if you haven't seen it, uh, you can get it on so many platforms now. I think it started out on Thrillist, and then it went to uh, Amazon Prime. I see it there, uh, and probably other ways, uh, certainly on YouTube. But uh, yeah, so then that, you go, you go to, you've gone to more pizzerias in just doing that show than I've probably gone to in my life. Um, and and each one is kind of an adventure because you're looking at each one, you're, you're asking the question, is it really pizza or is it just some creative, innovative, you know, uh, sort of spinoff of pizza, which is a great kind of angle to take on it. And most of the time you seem to be championing the fact that, yeah, it's pizza. And Mark is on the other side saying, it, it, it ain't pizza. It's not pizza as I know pizza, which is, which is a fun way to frame the, the conversation. So that's part of your journey, but you've gone to, you know, as with your tours and, you know, not only in New York, but in other cities, you've seen a lot of pizza, more pizza than the average human being has seen. Uh, and, and then I did my journey in American Pie to far fewer places, but with a different kind of focus and target. And that was to try to answer the question, um, what is it that makes the difference between good and great? And at the time I wrote the book about 15, 16 years ago, there were only a handful of pizzerias in America that might have been categorized as great. And by great, I mean memorable. Um, but there were 99% of the pizzerias were all doing good work. Good work and, and good pizza was good enough and probably maybe even more profitable than some of the great pizzerias. But more importantly, the question for me was, what is that difference? Everybody's working with the same palate, flour, water, salt, yeast, sauce, cheese. So why do some places separate from the others? And I think in, over the last couple of days here, between Lee's demos and some of the other demonstrations we've seen, you know, we're starting to see what some of those things are that do make the difference. But what have you discovered in your various journeys? Well, first of all, I, my journeys began because of, I read your dang book. <laughs> and I'm like, if this guy's going around to these places, maybe, uh, I guess I could also check him out and see what I think. And I well, that was the idea. I think having... Having an experience like that, where I read what you experienced, and then I go and then either have something the same or different or similar in some way, I, I feel like even that is an essential part of well, so much fun about like 
about food, which is that it's something that you can share with other people, but mm -hmm. you can also have your own experience. So I love that idea. And, and now going around to places and, you know, deciding whether or not it's an amazing, I, I think, I think you, you say it when you give lectures and you say there are two kinds of pizza, there's good pizza and there's great pizza, something yeah, like that. Is it's good or very good. And, and yeah, exactly. Great, good or very good. Great. Yeah. Yeah. It's an old and joke, think, actually. They used to say that about Chinese food. There's only two kinds of Chinese food, good and very good. And I just... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, By the way, I, are you wearing your Ezo hat? You're wearing an Ezo oh, hat. We're wearing matching I'm hats. We're wearing matching, but you're, you're the, the, uh, the, the bad cowboy and I'm the good cowboy. I got the white hat. Yeah, and Justin's got the other one. Yeah, we got our Ezo head. guys all watching. So uh, we're, we're, this, is, this, this is a thank you to you Ezo guys for putting I, for This us. is... Well, yeah, I mean, Darren was on here chatting, and I said, well, I got to go get my hat, which I is actually exactly good. Yeah. yeah, I ran Perfect. out of so, so I, I got to ask you, oh, yeah, so, so about, about the, what, what, makes that, what makes some pizza, pizzerias even a higher function. I think it's when, when you're at the pizzeria or you're eating the food that you feel that this is something that's special. When it's something that feels like everything else or that it's ordinary, I feel like that's, that could be good. It could be, that's my neighborhood joint. I like it. It's special because it's always there for me. But in your travels, if you have no emotional connection to the place, then it's, it's tough. The pizzeria now, it, it's not up to them. It's, it's, they can set the table and hope that you are able to have some kind of unique experience. And I think like looking around at who's watching right now and who's part of this, all these people's pizzerias, they're set up so that you have an, you have an experience interacting with the pizza or the pizzeria itself. And I think that is bonkers amazing. Yeah. You know what I mean? When yeah. you go into the place and there's a vibe, there's a thing, there's a personality of the pizzeria. And that you don't even have to, you, it doesn't matter how long they fermented their dough. The fact that you you can feel some kind of connection with that I think is special. And that's why it's like chain pizzerias exist for convenience. They're not trying to make a special connection with you. They don't have to. Independent places get to do that. Like that's the beauty of a small pizzeria. Yeah, that's really true. And uh, you basically said in your own words, uh, uh, what I was trying to get at in my book, uh, when you were talking about that special experience, I called it the memorable experience. And, and it used to be so rare. But aren't you finding that now it's becoming um, more attainable? There's so many more places delivering that kind of special experience. Yeah, I think, I think for a while pizza was this insular food where it was these, you know, like, especially where I grew up in the Northeast, these, you know, it was an Italian business. It was a, a, a lot of the pizzerias used the same ingredient. And so the products did end up coming out the same way because the technique and ingredients were very similar. And now you have people exploring more and finding themselves themselves in the food, and I just think there's more variation, and that's that's variation leads to specialty. If everybody's doing the same thing, I don't think it's as exciting. Now pizza has attracted bakers, chefs, and when bakers and chefs come together, when the scientists of the kitchen and the artists of the kitchen come together, there's the combination of the two in oh. It's a triangle. It's another triangle, Peter. We've discovered another one. <laughs> another it's, it's another. It's another union. The union of the. Yeah, Justin. I like it. I like the way you're putting all these words together. This is great. Yeah. But, uh, well, I've had a lot of wine. <laughs> and, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> but also, you've had you've had a chance to see a lot of what's going on out there. Um, yeah. And one of those things is. Uh, and you've led me to a number of places that you, you know, when I'm heading certain places, I say, where do you suggest I go? I you're my first go to on all that, because I know that you've probably been there. Um, and, and especially when I come to New York, New York City, uh, you've taken me some pretty amazing places in the, in the, in the boroughs and in the city itself. So I love it when we go on a little pizza adventure. It's a dream. It's, I thought it was you so know what it is? It, it's like it's like those um books and those movies you read as a kid when you're able to jump into the book. <laughs> right. You know, like a, I, you know, like it's a Narnia situation where I'm like, ah, exactly. And, yeah. and and uh, falls down, smoke comes. I'm in the book. Right. Well, um, 
let me ask you this, you know, because when we, we did one where we went around uh, uh, mostly to Brooklyn, uh, but with a little bit of Manhattan, looking for some great square pies and Sicilian pies, more pan style pizzas. Um, and again, uh, even since we did that, and we did that together about almost two years ago, I think, um, so I've seen so many other new places opening up. Is, is square pies really the, and pan pies really happening in a big way now? Are you seeing that? Yeah, major it's way. I think, I think it's an opportunity for pizza makers to show off their skill because, you know, the, the, how the quality of your dough is going to be expressed in the crumb structure of your final product. And square pies give you this opportunity to kind of show that off. Yeah. Whereas a round pie, a lot of people will look at it from the top down and like, okay, that's the view. The cross section is not as exciting for most people, but on a square, there's a cross section. I mean, like literally, there's something different to look at for normal humans. And I think that's, that's part of what's doing it. Also, yeah, it's, I, you know, it's structurally sound. It can hold a lot of stuff. Yeah. It's true. You, so it could be a, a, a major investment in a meal. I mean, you've got just a, one slice could be like a meal. Yeah. But, but um, you know, a few years ago, I, uh, when I was way back when I was writing American Pie, and I went on a little bit of a pizza hunt with, uh, with this writer named Jeffrey Steingarten, who's written a number of great books. And, uh, and he was obsessed with pizza at the time, being able to make a great pizza at home. Uh, and uh, we ended up going to, uh, to Brooklyn together to um, uh, Dom DeMarco's place. Uh, and, you know, we'd, I hadn't been there and we, he hadn't been there either. And on the way there, he said, listen, I just want to warn you ahead of time. He said, I'm real fussy about, you know, pizza. Uh, I, and for me, it's 90% about the crust and 10% about the topping. And I said, well, I'm more like about 80, 20, but I'm with you. At least it is. I think it really, the, the uh, starting point of what makes a, a pizza special, not just the, the, the context of the place, the, the, the ambiance and everything that makes it special too. But as far as the pizza itself, the pure paradigmatic pizza, I think it really begins with a great crust. You can have a great or memorable pizza without a great crust. That's my premise. And there are other people that maybe will disagree with that and they want to put the emphasis on the sauce and the cheese and everything. But I think if you have an average crust, it doesn't matter how great the toppings are that go on top. It will never be anything more than an interesting pizza, but it won't be necessarily a memorable one. Uh, where do you stand on the crust versus topping dialogue? You're blowing my mind right now, Peter. You're blowing my mind. Why? I got to. So where I stand on it is, I I think I'm I'm also in the crust being more significant, and for me it's a physical reason because you could have a bite that has no tomato, you could have a bite that has no cheese. All these things are possible. You don't have a bite of pizza that has no crust. Then you're eating the stuff that fell off the pizza. Mm -hmm. The crust, the, the bread component is the central component, but for me it's. If that's the only thing that's good about it, it's not a great pie. So I actually got a question for you, Mr. Peter Reinhardt. Okay. If I were to say that every single crust in the world was equally the same good, great thing, what's next for you in importance of ingredients? After the crust? Yeah, ignore the crust. The crust is it's all the same. Next. Uh, well... Of course, it's hard, to, it's hard to make them all the same because there's so many different styles. So in the crust itself first, I think the thing that sort of, sort of starts the whole stampede of greatness is the snap, the, little, the snap of the crust as opposed to just the breadiness of the crust. I, I love when I- Are you avoiding the question? Well, I'm going to move to, I'm moving into it. I got to start from that because it's, I'm talking about texture right now. And so if we're going to move into the next part of it, I'm talking about the texture of the crust which starts at the undercrust. You get that snap, that crackle, that hot buttery toast kind of quality. And then, uh, then that, that sets everything else up that goes on top. So when it goes on top, I mean, I, I think if I'm being honest with myself, I'm totally a cheeser. You know, I love cheese. And, and I could, whether it's got sauce or not, it, you know, the cheese is what I, what, I, what I crave when I have a good pizza. And I think that good sauce and cheese pizza marry so well together that it's, you know, it's, it's hard to beat. It's like, 
you don't really need any anything else beyond that. But um, but then I you know then it begs the question: Well, what kind of cheese? You know, why is it that sort of why is it that um, low moisture mozzarella has become sort of the classic you know uh, pizza pizza cheese for New York style pizzas? And what about versus fresh cheese? What about other cheeses? And so when I was doing my most recent book, the uh, Pan Pizza book, I started playing around with a lot of different kinds of cheeses and with cheese blends and things like that. You know, I, I started, to, I, I came to the realization that the notion of a four cheese pizza or a five cheese pizza or a six cheese pizza, it's really doesn't, it doesn't add anything. The, you can have lots of different cheeses and you may get a slightly unique flavor from those, but really what you want to taste is that, that special quality of each cheese. So sometimes I think it's almost better to stick with one or two cheeses, you know, maybe a dry aged cheese to as a garnish on the top to kind of set everything off, but a nice creamy cheese. And there are a lot of other creamy cheeses besides mozzarella. You know, there's provolone, there's fontina, there's brick cheese, uh, which is basically an American, you know, sort of Munster. In fact, Munster itself is, I think, a totally underappreciated uh, cheese oh. and, and, also, and also cheddar. Uh, I think is, you know, I think Italians scoff at cheddar cheese because it's not Italian um, and it, it maybe not used in Italy, but I think it's a secret ingredient in some of the great American pizzas as well. So, uh, yeah, so I do love, you know, a good, a nice cheese blend. If you're, you know, if, if the cheeses are adding something that the other one's missing, like Munster, Munster to me is a little undersalted. So I like to mix it with some cheddar, gives it a little edge, a little bit of, you know, saltiness uh, and acidity. But, but I, I think, too much cheese, too many types of cheese, just muddle the 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 story. Does that make sense? I'm with you on that. It makes a lot of sense. Munster, I love Munster. I need to have Munster on pizza as soon as possible. Yeah, you don't see it that much, but you know what I have was, uh, I called one of the manufacturers in Wisconsin who make the brick cheese. And it's hard to find, you know, for a home, a home cook, finding brick cheese is not easy. Um, and it's a little bit easier now because I see it out there now, but uh, a year or so ago, uh, even some uh, pizzerias that didn't already have access to, you know, like some of the Detroit pizzeria brands could get a steady flow of brick cheese. But the new ones, new pizzerias were having a hard time getting it because there wasn't that much of it. So I called this one guy uh, at uh, Zimmerman Cheese and, he's, and I asked him, you know, what should I tell people where to get your cheese or to get brick cheese? And he said, well, it's going to be hard. He said, there's a limited amount. We don't make that much of it. But um, he says, but tell them to go to Munster because we only make two kinds of cheeses in our, in our creamery here. We make Munster and we make brick. And huh. the fact is, is that they're made by the exact same process. There's just, there's a little bit of difference in aging. And I think the, the, the Munster's a little creamier and a little more buttery. It's not as a softer. It's a little softer, but essentially it's a, it's a, it's, and I never would have put those two together. There's, I would have said that there's a little Munster quality in brick, but I wouldn't have thought that they were that so as close as he said. But what I found was, was when I mixed that, um, that Munster with, um, with either equal parts Fontina or cheddar or any other kind of more sharp cheese, um, I, I got the qualities of a brick, of that brick cheese, which is so unique to the Detroit style pizza. Anyway, uh, so that, that's what turned me on to the Munster side of things. And I realized this is a totally underappreciated cheese when it comes to you know, make a grilled cheese sandwich and use Munster. It can change your life. Oh, you, you are hitting me in my heart right now. A grilled cheese sandwich with Munster sounds awesome. Yeah. Yeah, let's go right out and get one. <laughs> where, where do you stand on uh, burnt cheese? Um, well, I like, you know, I, I like Fricos, you know, I like that, that burnt little cheesy. Crispy Is somebody coming in, Alex, you coming in? I hear some other voices. You, Scott, you still there? Oh, I'm here. I'm here. I'm seeing I'm Alex. Never leave me. I'm seeing Alex, Alex here on the, on the screen. Yeah. He's trying he to distract to make, us. And knows how to make an entrance. <laughs> he really does. He's looking great in that suit, but he's not moving very much. No, he's not giving us a lot of movement. If he's gonna, if, I'd like to hear a, a couple of good jokes from him, though. Um, anyway, the um, uh, what were you we were talking about? Cheese, I think, right? Yeah, oh, burnt cheese. You were saying I like yeah. the frico. I like, and I like my cheese really well caramelized. I don't know about you, but I like, I like it when the cheese gets the golden brown. And not necessarily. There's a difference between caramel and carbon. 
And I think that, you know, you got to watch out. You don't want to, you want, don't want to transition over from caramelization to carbonization uh, because then the bitterness comes out too strong. But the nice thing about caramelization is, is it does bring out a little bit of a bitterness that actually is pleasant when it's married to sweetness and savoriness and umami and the other factors of cheese. So bitter actually sets up your, your palate to experience flavors more intensely. So I think that that's one of the reasons why caramelization is so important in all cooking, not just in pizza making and, and bread making, but you know, you caramelize a steak for the same reason. It's a different, it's a, it's a, it's a different kind of caramelization than, than sugar caramelization. It's a, a protein caramelization. It's a mild reaction, but it's still, the caramelization creates another flavor profile that actually enhances all the other flavors that are going on. So. You're making me hungry. I know, I know. That's yeah. why I, I ate before we started this because I was afraid of that. So Peter, are you, are you, you're just staying in the house, right? Like you're just staying put. Yeah, we're hunkered down here. The city of Charlotte is, uh, I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. We're, uh, we're shut down like, like many other cities. And, um, uh, and unfortunately, I've been able to do a lot of work. I teach at Johnson & Wales. So um, we've transitioned our academic courses to online, but we haven't been able to transition our hands-on culinary courses to an online version. So we're working on that now, but uh, what, we're, what we had to do is close the, the culinary school and we wow. tentatively scheduled a reopen this summer. Everyone's giving up their summer vacation if we get the green light. It's all a big if, but if we get the green light and can get the students to come back down, we're going to give them the part of this. They missed their, their spring uh, term. We had trimesters going this year and they would have missed their, their spring trimester. So we're going to repeat it for them in a uh, sort of wow. a blitz fashion this summer if we get the green light. And that's a very big if. Wow. Yeah. yeah and wild. That magnify that by all the other programs around the country. Everybody's struggling with it. But here's the question I have for you right now. Are you struggling with the program of access to pizza right now? Um, well, I know we can get pizza because there are some pizzerias locally, uh, like Inizio, where where uh, they make a nice uh, Neapolitan pizza. Uh, they're open. There's a few other places that are still open for pickup and delivery, and so we can get pizza. It's not it's not uh, impossible. Do you have supplies at home for pizza production? Well, I have, I'm out of cheese. So the only cheese I have left are some of my hard cheeses. I've used up all my good creamy cheeses. Uh, so I have to go make a, you know, some kind of either a cheese run or have it brought in. But um, believe it or not, and this, this may sound like heresy, but, uh, you know, we did, we did wipe out our freezers uh, frozen pizzas because I find that even a frozen pizza is better than no pizza, number one. Yeah. And two, the frozen pizza category has definitely improved and raised its game over the last five and 10 years. And so there are some good ones out there. At least they're satisfying. I wouldn't necessarily call, call them the special experience, but they're Which satisfying. One? Well, well, the one brand that I'm associated with most personally, so this is like a full disclosure thing, is I, I developed a pizza line for Amy's Kitchen, which are vegetarian uh, organic pizzas. And we even you know now have uh, a new uh, uh, gluten-free version and a cauliflower version, but all the pizzas for the last 20 years were from uh, formulas that I helped develop with them. I work with their yeah. team. And, and so I think they do a very, very good frozen pizza. Uh, and, and there's certainly some other brands that I've run into, um, but I haven't, um, and then, that, you know, like a Trader Joe's, we don't even know who's making the, the Trader Joe's brand pizza. We just know that they're pretty good, whatever they sell at Trader Joe's. Yeah. Really good. And even Whole Foods, uh, has their own branded pizza now. And so th they're always co-packing, they're hiring and you know contracting with other frozen companies to do it for them. Uh, Amy's is unique because they are the, one of the few companies that actually make it themselves. They, they don't like to farm it out. They like to produce it. They like hiring people. And so they make everything in their own facility. Whereas most branded frozen pizzas are made by four or five co-packers around the country. But so whoever Trader Joe's and and uh, Whole Foods are using, uh, they're doing a pretty good job, I think, in giving you a satisfying experience. Yeah, I just. But we used man, up our. Have one of those. Wow. We've used up our inventory. Yeah, we're we're, we're out. <laughs> but so what, we're, we're doing. Well, what about? Time. I got to ask you the question that's on everybody's mind over here. 
how much flour does Peter Reinhardt keep in an emergency situation like this? <laughs> uh, well, actually, I don't keep a lot here. I have my my containers of you know various kinds of flour. I have some whole wheat flour, some some bread flour, some all purpose, and some sprouted flour, sprouted wheat flour, because I'm really big on sprouted. Uh, but uh, and normally, because I'm teaching bread all the time at Johnson and Wales, I don't really need to bake a lot of bread at home. Uh, and, yeah. if, and when we do make some nice breads at the school or when my students do, I'll bring a few loaves home and put them in our freezer. Uh, and we're, of course, we're working our way through those now as well. So I haven't barely been baking a lot of bread personally, but I have been taking a lot of emails from people uh, who are working off of various recipes, whether it's mine or someone else's, and they're stuck somewhere. They're wondering about how much dough to put in a pan. Uh, so I just have, you know, so I, I have a little bit of a uh, uh, unofficial, you know, sort of, uh, what would you call it? Not consulting, but guidance program going here, helping people navigate through the, uh, the the confusing parts of a recipe. Yeah, I bet. Is that is that the big? Uh, what's the number one question people are emailing you right now? A lot of it has to do with sourdough, sourdough starters. Yeah. And when they're starting to make, when people are making their sourdough starters, this will be true for those who want to use it for pizzas as well. Um, is at the if you don't already have an established sourdough starter that you've been keeping and you need to make one from scratch it it's there's lots of different methods for how to do it and some of them uh promise that it'll be ready in five days some will say it'll take five to 20 days you know there's no and there's no way to actually give a hard number because the the time that it takes and it goes back to my to my uh my baking triangle of time temperature and ingredients it's totally dependent on what the ambient or room temperature is that you're working at, uh, what's the climate like where you live, what time of year, the flour that you're using comes in with a certain amount of wild yeast and natural bacteria already on it, what is it bringing in? Uh, and and so, um, so the main thing that I have to tell them is, is because there's a tendency for people to let go, I've been doing this for seven days and it's not rising, it's not bubbling, I, I finally gave up on it and throw it out. And I kind of rushed an email in all capitals, don't give up on your starter, you know, because it, it'll come back. It's very resilient. All you have to do to keep it from getting moldy, and that's what they're afraid of, is it's going to, if it sits too long and nothing happens, you'll, it'll start to get uh, like mold on top. And mold is just other bacteria and fungi that are taking, trying to grab, you know, their share of the, of the nutrients. Um, so what you do is, is every, within every eight hours or so, you either stir, if you're using a sponge starter, or if you're making a firm starter, uh, like bread dough style, then knead it for just a few seconds, just to kind of get all the surface organisms mixed into the main body, because the one, the organisms that are already in the main body will defend their turf and they'll, they'll get rid of any invaders. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then, and, and it just may need more time and just give it the time that it needs. You can't rush it. Uh, it will happen on its own, you know, pace. Um, and when it does, you'll know it because then you'll see the signs of life, the doughs or the sponges will start to bubble up and rise, and then you'll be ready to move to the next steps. So yeah, so number one, uh, one, number one uh, uh, guidance is don't give up on your starter if it's not performing according to the instructions, but just remember to keep it, you know, keep it fresh by, by stirring it, and every once in a while you can add some more flour and water to it to refresh it with some more fresh food. Mm -hmm. That's so that's advice. One. I bet. Do you think think people are starting to make starters because they're stuck at home right now and they didn't buy any yeast? I think possibly, but I also I think sourdough is really hot right now. It's uh, we we have a saying. I do this bread symposium every year at Johnson and Wales. We had a nice one lined up for this summer that we had to cancel for this year. But um, we bring in ten speaker, kind of like a TED conference, ten of ten or twelve dynamic speakers to talk about the future of bread. And one of the phrases that we came up with in the first year is, is that the future of bread lies in its past, meaning that the old original ways of making bread before there was yeast was all with natural starter or what we now call sourdough. Uh, and, and there's a reason you know, that that works and why it makes bread that's probably better than bread that's made with just yeast. Now you can make great memorable fantastic bread with just yeast, with commercial yeast. Uh, just like you can make great pizza with commercial yeast. By understanding how fermentation works and extending the fermentation long enough to develop 
the complex flavors that are, are needed. But with natural starters, you get even complexity on top of complexity. And I think people are really drawn to that. It's kind of like flying without a net when you're doing a sourdough starter because yeast is like the safety net. It, it makes it almost foolproof. Whereas sourdough starters, you have to keep the starter alive. You've got, you know, you're, it's kind of like feeding a pet. And so you feel a little bit of proprietary ownership of that. There's a lot of connection. And you said, used the word earlier about uh, going to a pizzeria and being connected to it. And I think that that's really the, the core of what makes bread, whether it's in the form of a bread or in the form of a pizza, such a special food to us. It's so intrinsic to our natures is, is, that, is that it provides a, a connecting point to something, to a bigger story than ourselves. And uh, sourdough is uh, there's such a long history of making bread. And a, a friend of mine just wrote a book. He was one of the presenters at our symposium two years ago. And he's written the book. It hasn't come out yet. But it's kind of the whole story of sourdough and told in a very lively and interesting way. It, it tells the whole story of like 6,000 years of bread and, and the role of sourdough and why sourdough is coming back again. And part of it, so many reasons, but one of it is, is that People love the process once they get into it. And if you make regular bread uh, or even use a bread machine as an entry point to get into it, after a while, you want the, the bigger challenge. You want to be able to fly without a net. And sourdough is the way to do it. And it tastes really, you can't make better tasting bread than you can make with a properly made naturally leavened bread. And, and you can also use a combination of commercial yeast and natural leaven to make a, a very good bread that's not sour, but that has the complex flavors of a sourdough bread. So when somebody's doing that, what do you recommend in terms of how much uh, it should be yeasted, commercial yeast, and how much it should be sourdough? Um, well, Noel earlier today, I don't know if he's come back yet, but Noel has this great chart that 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 he got he downloaded it uh, off of I think uh, pizzamaking.com that talks about what ratio, what percentage of sourdough starter to flour you should put in and then you know depending on how much starting how long you put in, then the time so no maybe at some point you can put that up oh, he's putting it back up on the screen right now for us uh so there's that chart and and if people want to get that it's from pizza it's from the pizza making forum so uh what do they do they just go to pizza making.com no uh yeah they can go to pizza making.com um the guy who originally posted that was tx craig and he's a uh, absolutely um, monolithic figure on the pizza making forum. <laughs> cool. um, there's a lot of them out there, but TX Craig is is unapologetic and outspoken, and and actually compared to most, sorry, compared to many of the people on the forum, he's <laughs> right more time than he's wrong. Yeah. You know, I learned it the hard way because like sometimes when people spoke with passion, I would take it as the gospel and just change everything I was doing and be like, all right, I'm I'm only going to use active dry yeast now because that's how they do it in New York. And then uh, it didn't really help. Would it be possible for you to put that URL up on the on the chat? Side? I mean, here's the thing. The answer is yes, but not an immediate yes, because at the end of this, we're going to be asking for more donations. I feel like we gave everybody access uh, to the to this unbelievable forum for three days for only five dollars. That's like a buck fifty a day and change. So we're going to be asking for more donations for Scott's charity uh, at the end of the drive, and I think we should set a target for ourselves. And if we hit that target, then I'm going to give everybody what they want. And if not, uh, we'll see. We'll see. We, you can't have everything, right? And also, you know, if you want, you can go to pizzamaking.com and you can, you can go to TX Craig's account. And I think he's only got like 50,000 entries. So yeah. it should take more than a few weeks to find what you're looking for. Really. Or, or you could really make him pay for it by writing to him himself directly and just then and putting Nah, he's an ornery character. He's not going to return your. But, but, I, I but, noticed that, uh, by the way, uh, no, I noticed that we're getting a lot of questions on the Q&A. Should we try to handle some before we run out of time? I mean, I wish you would. I'm having some lunch, so I'm going to go back to that, and I'll see okay, you in well, about I'm, three I'm and a half minutes. Q and A, Scott, and uh, and our friend Sirhan uh, asked the question: Do you see sprouted flour becoming popular in pizza making? And and of course, my answer is always yes to that. But Scott, you you've been out there. Are you seeing it uh, showing up in any pizzas anywhere? I am not seeing it pop up that much at all. It's like a very few and far between kind of thing. Uh, but I would love to know more about sprouted flour. I mean, I, I get it. It's 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 wheat berries that are left, I guess, wet, and then they are sprouted. But well, yeah. what are the benefits? And, yeah. and what? what how do you work with it? There's a lot of benefits. The two main ones are that they're more digestible and nutritious 
for you because the sprouting uh, activates a whole bunch of enzyme activity that, that breaks down the barriers to absorbing the nutrition inherent in the grain itself that our bodies tend to, you know, don't get. If you eat even whole wheat flour, you don't get all the uh, nutrients in the whole wheat flour because there's, uh, there's other um, parts of the, of the berry that are designed to uh, protect it from uh, invaders and from predators. And so uh, it blocks that nutritional exchange. Sprouting breaks that down. It's a phytic acid is what causes that. Uh, so, and then also in the process of sprouting, the wheat becomes sweeter. Now the downside of sprouting is, is that it also, it compromises the gluten forming abilities, uh, which in the negative side makes it harder for the gluten to develop. So, you know, it's, you don't get necessarily those big, long open holes uh, and on the positive side, of course, it also makes it more tolerable for people who might have gluten sensitivity. I won't say celiac level sensitivities, but sensitivity, there's a lot of people who report anecdotally that they can tolerate sprouted wheat in ways that they cannot tolerate regular wheat. Those are some of the things. Then, so the big challenge then is, is uh, how do you incorporate it into your dough without, um, you know, without losing the, your customers who are in love with white flour pizza dough. Uh, and I'd say just a little, a little bit at a time, you know, we, we have a pizzeria here that I uh, helped start and that uses, they have a whole separate 100% sprouted dough, but we only sell maybe 10% of the pizzas are, are made on that dough because most people will, will punt back to the regular classic doughs. Uh, so I say, you know, use about 20 to 25% sprouted wheat and it doesn't have to be sprouted wheat. It could be sprouted spelt could be sprouted rye, it could be any kind of sprouted grain. And, um, and, and it's a flour, you can get it in flour form, but from, there's a couple of companies that sell it already sprouted, dried, and milled into flour. And then there are companies like, uh, well, you've heard of uh, Ezekiel bread, where they make a bread that's made out of 100% sprouted grains that are then ground into a mash, into a pulp. And then they add gluten back into that pulp and then yeast and other things to make bread from it. So uh, there's a lot of ways to use sprouts, either in a dry form or in a, in a pulp form. And, and uh, that's all I'll say about it because we're running out of time. But if anyone's interested, I did write a book about it called Bread Revolution. And if you just look up Bread Revolution, you can get a lot of, of the headlines just by uh, looking at the, the free part that they give you on Amazon. Um, and, I, and I give the whole story of both those styles of sprouts and, and the benefits. Okay, I, I see some more questions here. Um, the, the different difference between the original Umberto's grandma and the King Umberto's grandma, besides the oregano, oregano in the sauce. So who was it? We had somebody on earlier from, from uh, King Umberto's. Is he still on with us? That's John Chez. Is it, was it John? Yeah, John. I don't G think on right now. Yeah, but he, you know what? Let's hold that question until he comes okay. back because he will be back. Save that one. Uh, but Scott, do you know, you, you, if anybody else besides Giovanni would know, it would be you. Yeah, yeah. Short answer is the King Umberto's one is thinner. The Umberto's one is a little bit thicker. It's like they, they let it rise a little bit, so it's a little puffy and a little bit softer on the bottom. King Umberto's one is thinner and crispier. Um, do you know the origin story? Who, which, who gets the bragging rights for being the, the original original? Is it Umberto's or is it King Umberto's? Neither. It was people's grandmothers. Come on. It was not like a piece <laughs> that reinvented that. Come on. Well, I, every time somebody wants to argue about who invented it, they're, it's, they're not realizing the whole point. The whole point is that that was the pizza that you made at home before the days when everybody had pizza stones at home. Or not everybody, you know, like weirdos and maybe some normal people. But, you know, you made pizza at home in a, in a tray. and it, You didn't call it anything special. But who the was the one that, 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 that gave it the it. name? Who gave it the name Grandma Pizza first? John Chaz will fill in the blanks. It's the guy who was the pizza maker at Umberto's, left Umberto's, went to King Umberto's, he started making it there. And the legend is that he started calling it the grandma when he was working at King Umberto's, wow. not when he was working at Umberto's. Now that, is, even knows. that, that is solid gold right there. That's pretty cool. That's kind of a little bit like, uh, like Frank Pepe's and Sally's up in New Haven, you know, how one grew out of the other or, or how Totono's grew out of They're Lombardi. All related. They're all related. We're all cut and paste, as I would like to say. We're all cut and paste, right? Guys, uh, you know, this is the time for our pizza party. Uh, you guys 
have been absolutely outstanding. A lot of a lot of the participants are just saying that they could listen to you guys talk for a couple more hours. So I just wanted to get on and say thank you guys, thank you guys, thank you guys so much. One thing that I was just wondering about when we were talking about the crust versus the toppings, I think that what I like to discuss is like the foundation. Foundation is what you build on. And if you've got good foundation, whether it's your family or pizza or uh, relationships of any kind, just being a good person, then you can build on it. And that's the way, that's my two cents. If you've got good foundation, you can put not so good ingredients, but you're still going to have a great pizza. However, if you don't have good foundation, you put really expensive ingredients on top, it's still, eh, who knows. And then just one question that I had, uh, you guys were talking about the Monster Fontina mix. Yeah. Um, which I love because I cannot get brick cheese. I'm in Los Angeles. Yeah. I can't seem to get brick cheese anywhere. Um, and a lot of people like uh, using the higher fat mixes, right? That, that one of the, it's, it's a higher fat in the cheese because I know that when I burn, I love burnt cheese. I love it. Always have. Um, but one of the problems is if you're using like a mozzarella, it gets too done. Whereas a higher fat cheese like the monster or the Fontina or the brick uh, actually gives you that nice golden Frico, correct? Right. Well, I, I think so. Yeah. Without burning. Yeah. Uh, and I, and of course the fat makes it taste good too. Uh, it's a, but it gives it that buttery quality. So, so there's a lot of reasons, you know, to go with the, with uh, uh, some of those other cheeses yeah. uh, and brick, I think it's just whoever the, there's a, there's a whole uh, origin story of how brick cheese was invented and developed by a, a, a German cheesemaker in New York who then moved to Wisconsin. And I think he, he just nailed it. He came up with something unique and, and, uh, and, and I'm amazed that it never became bigger than it, than it is. And it's, it's bigger now than ever because of the Detroit pizza crave. Yeah. I have family in Ohio that can get it at the Kroger. I can't find it anywhere. So, it, you know, it is but, what it is, right? But, so. but despair not because all you, anybody can get Munster and anybody can get Fontina or provolone or a Gouda even works really well. There's a lot of really good cheeses that can go into that blend to make- like a white cheese. cheddar I've been using with a, like, a, like a Fontina mix. I love it, I love it. I, I will say one more time, I think cheddar is the most underappreciated, most maligned cheese because it's, for some reason, and I don't know why, because it's one of the great cheeses of the world. And when it burns on the edge, it, bec it becomes beautiful gold. I mean, it becomes that beautiful golden color, so. 